Hello, this is Scott Horton. I will be presenting today's webinar in just a few minutes. We just opened the room for attendees to join. So as you are doing that, just get yourself oriented. You should have access to a chat window where you'll be able to enter questions to be answered later on at the end of the presentation. You should also see the cover slide for today's presentation, Employee Leave in New York. Uh, as I said, we will get started in just a few minutes at the scheduled start time once everyone has had a chance to get logged in. I'll go over all these details again, but just as people are getting logged in, um, the slides will be available at the end of the presentation, or if you are registered for the webinar, you will receive an email tomorrow with a link to those materials as well. Again, question and answer will be through the chat function. I will generally answer those questions at a question and answer segment at the end of the presentation but feel free to type in your questions whenever you have them so you don't forget. I'm gonna go ahead and allow two or three more minutes for everyone to get signed in and ready to go, and then we will begin. We have really good turnout and some people are still logging in. So I'm just gonna give it another couple of minutes and then we will get started. I'm just gonna pop in every so often here so everyone can make sure that they are hearing me. All right, it's about the scheduled start time, but we still have a couple of people gradually joining in. So I'm gonna give it another maybe 30 seconds or a minute and then get started. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and begin at least with a few preliminaries and then we'll get into the substance of the presentation in a moment. Uh, again, my name is Scott Horton. I am a partner with a law firm called Gunner Cook LLP. I also have a website where I run a blog and link to webinars and other information that I have available. That's through Horton Management Law at hortonplc.com. Today's presentation is sort of an ambitious topic, employee leave in New York, navigating legal requirements and practical challenges. The slides will be made available at the end of the presentation. And if you're registered, you will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the slides as well. So you can either download them later at the end of the presentation, or if you can't stay on that long or otherwise want to just wait for the email, that's fine. If for some reason you can't get the slides through either of those means, then of course you're welcome to reach out to me. My contact information is at the end of this presentation, but again, you can certainly find me online. 
Uh, just in case you have any technical issues, try to close out other windows or what have you. And we will do a question and answer at the end. We're scheduled for about one hour. I will stay on to answer any and all questions that I can beyond that point. If I happen to see a question as I'm discussing something and can address it at that point, I will. But typically, it's easier just to do all of that together at the end of the presentation. And I will let you know up front, there is a lot of information in this presentation, a lot of slides, and some slides that I will probably not discuss in much detail, but I wanted you to have all the information together as a resource once you download the slides later. So um, if it looks like I'm flipping through some things that by design, again, just to make sure your materials are more comprehensive, um, than I can possibly cover in the time we have. So just to orient us a little bit, what types of leave are we going to be discussing today? Uh, many of them are going to be related to the first couple items on this list, employees' medical condition or the employee's family member's medical condition. Overall, that will be in one way or another the bulk of the leave circumstances we're discussing today, but somewhat related to that and, and generally following many similar principles is issues related to pregnancy and childbirth for that matter. There's also an important uh, topic on military service that we won't really be addressing in today's presentation. There's a federal statute called USERA that has very specific requirements for how and when employers have to allow employees to take time off to go perform military service, being called up to active duty or as a reserve. Uh, that topic is very detailed and not something that we're going to try to tackle today, but if and when um, you have an employee request leave for military service, be aware that there is certainly a law that has many uh, nuanced requirements in that area. Uh, that might be something that I can discuss in a future presentation, but um, it's not going to be part of this conversation today. Um, there are other types of leave, vacation or other paid time off that employers may allow employees to have. There's generally no legal obligation to or to provide that in New York. But once you do decide that you're going to allow employees to have vacation, you should have a written policy or some form of written notification of what the parameters around that are. And then at that point, those rights do become binding, at least until you change your policies in writing. Uh, similarly, bereavement at this point is not covered by law generally in New York State. If you allow employees bereavement leave, again, you should carefully address it in written policies and procedures. But unless you want to allow employees to take paid bereavement leave or unpaid bereavement leave for that matter, um, you're not formally obligated to do that. There was legislation a couple of years ago that would have added bereavement leave to the paid family leave law in New York, um, which would have, as written, allowed up to 12 weeks of paid, partially paid anyway, leave uh, for bereavement. That was not signed by Governor Cuomo at the time, um, and it remains to be seen whether some form of bereavement leave will become law in New York. There are other forms of leave that you might be familiar with, jury duty leave, for example, there are some um, blood donation leave and other types of um, cancer screening leaves, et cetera. We're not gonna go into the details on all of those particular statutes that may apply because they're pretty specific and relatively easy to follow once you read the, the statute. Certainly those are things that should be in your employee handbook or most likely are in your employee handbook. And if and when they become relevant, then you can look into them further. But 
for the interest of time, we're going to spend most of our time, again, related to medical conditions, pregnancy, childbirth, those types of complex legal situations that often are governed by multiple different state and federal and in New York City, even city laws. So what types of laws does that include? That's the New York paid sick leave law, which is more or less the newest of these requirements. Again, New York City has their own paid sick leave law. Um, however, for the most part, complying with the state law is going to put you in compliance with New York City's law. So we're not going to spend too much time today on the distinctions between New York City and New York State paid sick leave requirements. The New York paid family leave law, which I already mentioned, obviously is a significant new regime that came into place uh, several years ago. Many of you are familiar with that by now. New York paid COVID-19 leave law, obviously again, came in a few years ago. Many of you have been dealing with that over the past few years and are hoping that you won't have to be dealing with it much longer. So we'll discuss briefly the status of those requirements. Then, of course, we have the Family and Medical Leave Act, the federal statute that's been around for over 30 years now that entitles employees to unpaid leave in certain circumstances. So we will go over generally some of the key principles of the FMLA, but primarily so that we can discuss how those requirements interact with various of these other laws that New York employers have to deal with. Again, there are various other specific New York leave laws. A couple of them will get mentioned in today's presentation. Um, certainly some of them will not be, but you, you know that there may be a couple of other leave laws if you're not familiar with what those are. Um, you know, there you can reach out and I'll point you in the right direction. Then there's sort of a catch-all related to a lot of what we're going to be talking about in the form of leave as an accommodation. Generally speaking, uh, that's going to be for disability under the ADA and or the New York human rights laws. Again, if you're in New York City, it's New York State human rights law and or New York City human rights law that's going to provide disability accommodation requirements. And there are a couple of other scenarios where there could be uh, obligations for employers to allow time off from work as an accommodation. And then finally, as I mentioned, there's the other types of leave that are made available uh, initially at the employer's discretion, such as vacation, um, bereavement, or personal time. And the important thing about that, again, is you have to document it properly, but that especially with New York's paid sick leave law coming into effect, there are issues with how a PTO policy may or may not satisfy your requirements under these other various laws. So that will be something that will be addressed multiple times as we go forward in today's presentation. All right, we're gonna begin with probably the most complicated uh, statutory regime that's now applicable to New York employers who are subject to the FMLA and or the paid family leave law. So we'll start with the federal law just because it's been around longer. Uh, signed by President Clinton in February of 1993. So obviously that's a little over 30 years ago now. Um, anyone who is practicing in the human resources area in an organization that has enough employees is going to be generally familiar with the FMLA. If you are in a organization that doesn't have 50 employees, and especially if you never worked in an organization that large, then you may not be as familiar with the FMLA, in which case there is a lot of information in the materials. Um, some of which I will discuss today specifically, a lot more information you can review on your own. And of course, any of you who are dealing with the FMLA on a regular basis, 
um, will also be able to flip through this material as well, just to make sure you're up to date and not missing anything. The FMLA technically applies to all public employers. So if you work for a government entity, uh, town, county, city, or a public authority in New York, then you are covered by the FMLA, which means you at least have to have the FMLA posting up and uh, perhaps a written policy. However, it is possible that you could be covered by the FMLA as an entity, but not have any employees who would be eligible because you would still have to have 50 or more employees as a public employer for anyone to be eligible to take FMLA leave. That being said, uh, for private employers, which is going to be most of you, um, you do have to have 50 plus employees before you're covered at all, meaning if you only have 17 employees, you don't even have to have an FMLA notice poster up. Um, you might have it on your, you know, sort of omnibus right poster that you might get through a third party, but unless you have 50 or more employees, you're not covered and not obligated to do that. But once you do have 50 employees or you start getting real close to 50 employees, then you have much more to be aware of and be considering how you're going to monitor. As I said before, a covered employer could not have any, any covered employees, and that could either be public sector or private sector, because it is possible that even if you have 50 or more employees in your private sector organization and the employer is therefore covered, um, none of the employees might qualify for reasons that we're going to discuss. Now, to be eligible to take leave uh, for FMLA qualifying purposes, the employee has to work for an FMLA covered employer, of course, and then also have to meet all three of these criteria first. They have to have been employed, employed for at least 12 months. They have to have worked at least 1,250 hours in the past 12 months, and they have to work at a work site where the employer employs at least 50 employees within 75 miles. So it's certainly possible you could have well over 50 employees scattered throughout New York State or throughout the country where none of them is in within a 75 mile radius of 50 or more employees, in which case nobody would technically be eligible for FMLA leave. Now, this all being said, there were many employers that didn't have to worry about this whole family leave issue because they were either too small, employees were too scattered, or at least they didn't have to worry about it until employees met all these criteria. As we'll see in a few minutes, when paid family leave came in, it doesn't have all of these requirements. Employees and employers become covered much more quickly under paid family leave. So there are many employers who are subject to both FMLA and paid family leave, but there are also many who are only covered by paid family leave at this point in time. Um, but if you are covered by both, you have to satisfy both at all times. Uh, I'm not going to go through every aspect of this slide, but here are the reasons why people can qualify for FMLA leave if they're otherwise eligible. Ultimately, it's related to some sort of employee or family medical issue and or the birth of a child or placement of a child for adoption or foster care with the employee. There is also a relatively recent, although more than a decade old now, a component for certain military related leaves where an employee's family member has to go on military service, which is different from the USERA law that I was referring to earlier, which involves employees themselves going off on military leave. So for serious health conditions, it has to be an injury, illness, impairment, or physical or mental condition that either involves inpatient care or continuing treatment by a healthcare provider. 
There are extensive regulations on the FMLA through the Federal Department of Labor. So if you're not familiar with those and you are subject to the FMLA, you should become somewhat familiar with them. There, there's a lot more detail on how to apply the FMLA. The continuing treatment component is broken down here. Various ways to satisfy that requirement. Incapacity and treatment that means that incapacity lasts more than three days and you have to have been treated by a healthcare provider um, either at least once resulting in a regimen of continuing treatment under the care of a healthcare provider or two or more times having actually received treatment within the first 30 days. These are not the issues that typically trip up employers. So I don't want to spend too much time on it. I'm just kind of working you a little bit through the logistics. Uh, again, here are some forms of FMLA leave that now can apply if the employee's uh, spouse, for example, is sent out on active military duty and there needs to be some action taken to respond to those changed circumstances. And that might be if the spouse who is now going on active military service was responsible for taking care of children, then the qualifying military exigency leave might now entitle someone to take FMLA leave to deal with those child care arrangements um, separate and apart from the situation where the child actually has a medical condition, which might otherwise be subject to FMLA leave. There is a specific distinction for the, a form of leave available in the case of active military members who have a serious illness or injury. Uh, along with a different set of standards for a veteran, i.e. a former military service member who has a serious illness or injury. And in those cases, the employee may be allowed up to 12 weeks of leave per year if the traditional uh, standards apply, meaning uh, a medical condition for a family member or a 26 week leave in a single 12 month period if the specific additional requirements for covered service member leave apply. So in other words, as you probably all know, 12 weeks is the basic FMLA principle, but the covered service member leave when the employee is eligible for leave under those circumstances to care for a family member who's a covered service member. There is both a specific single 12 month period, meaning they don't get it per year um, and a longer leave allowance of 26 weeks. That doesn't come up too often, but that is a amendment that took effect maybe 15 years ago now or thereabouts. So it wasn't originally in the FMLA. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these notice requirements. If you've dealt with the FMLA, you're well aware that there are certain documents that you can and are supposed to provide to the employee once they give sufficient notice that they may need FMLA leave. Um, as far as that goes, of course, there are no magic words. Employees don't have to say, I want to take leave under FMLA or the Family Medical Leave Act or Family Medical Leave. Um, they have to say more than I'm sick, but if it's enough information to suggest that they might be out for a long enough period uh, for some reason that might be covered by the FMLA, then you should be providing documentation to let them know whether they are eligible in the first place for FMLA leave and then whether you need additional information to determine whether uh, their absence will be covered by the FMLA. Um, in the case of foreseeable leaves, which uh, might include 
childbirth or a scheduled surgery, for example, employees are supposed to give at least 30 days notice. Otherwise, and, and the more typical case is they should give it as soon as practicable um, if, if something you know, arises an illness or injury comes up unexpectedly. There are a bunch of time periods for when documentation needs to be provided, returned, et cetera. But again, I don't want to get into all of that. Um, for many years, intermittent leave has been a headache for employers, um, which it means that we're not talking about a leave situation where the person's just going to be out for some fixed period up to 12 weeks out of a year, but they're going to be out on uh, intermittent or sometimes even ad hoc or unpredictable basis. The employer under FMLA has to allow intermittent leave when medically necessary for either the employee or the family member that they're caring for or for military related qualifying exigency. Um, the employer may permit intermittent leave for birth or placement of a child, which is more important now in New York than it used to be. Um, for the most part, employers didn't allow intermittent FMLA leave for the birth or placement of a child, but because of the paid family leave statute, which specifically allows intermittent leave for birth or placement of a child, um, you can and generally would count the leave under both paid family leave and the FMLA, even if it's intermittent in the childbirth situation. I, I got a question I'm going to go ahead and answer. Um, can you automatically put someone on FMLA once you become aware or do they have to agree to it? And no, the, the employee doesn't have to agree to it. The employer uh, certainly can designate FMLA leave even without a request and even against the employee's will, assuming that they're A, actually off work and B, uh, on, it's a circumstance that qualifies for FMLA leave. And we're going to touch on later uh, issue related to paid family leave there as well. So one of the requirements of FMLA, it's not a paid leave statute. It just gives people right to have the time off, but it does require the employer to maintain health benefit while the employee is out on leave. The employer thus must continue to make whatever health insurance premiums are necessary and the employee is expected to make whatever contributions they're normally obligated to make. If the employee isn't going to make contributions while they're out, which may be the case because they're not getting paid, then they can lose coverage while they are out. However, once they return to work, they have to be able to reinstate their health insurance immediately. And sometimes as a practical matter, it's not really possible to drop the health insurance during FMLA leave and then reinstate them upon return to work. So these are sometimes issues that need to be discussed and worked out with employees in advance. And there are ways, for example, to have employees agree to have uh, catch up contributions deducted from their pay after they return. Again, that kind of the, the nuts and bolts of that are beyond the scope of this discussion, um, but we certainly dealt with that in various ways. Um, if you need more guidance. So in addition to maintaining the health insurance, the principal uh, benefit of the FMLA, it says you can go out for this time and then you have the right to return back to work in the same uh, or similar position as to what you held when you left. Um, you, you retain all benefits in seniority that were accrued prior to the leave, but you don't have a right to accrue additional seniority or benefit during the leave period. That ends up being more complicated than it might seem at times, but that's the general notion. 
And then the employee returning from FMLA leave, as I said, either has to be returned to the same position or an equivalent position with equivalent pay benefits and other terms and conditions of employment. Now, there are going to be exceptions to that. And here they are principally. First of all, you have the key employee exception, which many of you may have heard of. I'd be surprised if many of you have actually ever invoked the key employee exception. Um, I have been dealing with the FMLA for almost 20 years for uh, literally hundreds of employers. And I only can remember one or two situations where the employer was seriously considering using the key employee provisions of the FMLA. Um, but that can happen if the employee is salaried and among the highest paid 10% of the employer's employees within a 75 mile radius. Typically though, employees at that level are people that the company wants to return to work anyway. Um, but if you are in the key employee situation, that warrants further discussion. Um, and then employees are not required to maintain employment that would have ended or changed for a reason other than the FMLA leave. So the right to reinstatement is not absolute in the sense that suppose you just close the business and lay off your entire workforce. You don't have any liability for not reinstating the employee. Where it becomes more complicated is a situation where something might have occurred during the FMLA leave where the employee uh, or, or yeah, the, the company has discovered that the employee wasn't performing well, or maybe even it engaged in some misconduct or something along those lines. So the, uh, you know, the law technically allows you to terminate someone um, for some reason other than the fact that they took FMLA leave. But of course you would have to be prepared to be able to show why you did it for a legitimate uh, non-discriminatory reason. In this case, meaning that you're not retaliating against them or refusing to reinstate them from the leave, but that, for example, they would have been terminated anyway, even if they hadn't been on leave. Okay, so the FMLA was complicated enough and then in 2017, we learned that we were going to have to start dealing with a paid family leave law throughout New York State. Uh, officially, the law took effect January 1st, 2018. So we are in, I think it would be the seventh year of paid family leave in New York. So many of you have had a fair amount of experience dealing with paid family leave issues by now, but we'll walk through some of the basics. Again, the job protection and health insurance continuation aspects of the FMLA are borrowed into the paid family leave. So again, generally you have the right to reinstatement after the leave and to continue your health care while you're on FMLA. The major distinction, of course, is right in the name, paid family leave, meaning that there is a partial wage replacement component to this New York law. Who's covered by paid family leave? It's all private companies who have at least one employee. And the government only in circumstances where they've opted in to pay family leave, which is relatively few circumstances. Originally, there were some bargaining issues when you're dealing with uh, unionized government employees, of which there are many in New York State. But at this point in time, public entities either are party to some agreement that is requiring them to participate in the FMA or in the paid family leave program, or they're not. Most are not, but all private employers have to, which think about it, is actually the opposite of the FMLA, which says that all uh, public employers are covered, but not necessarily all private employers. All right, so who are covered employees that, again, you'd have to work for a covered employer. 
then you're covered if you're a full-time employee who works a regular schedule of 20 or more hours per week and you've completed 26 consecutive weeks of employment. That's basically the, the full-time provision, even though the standard is only 20 or more hours per week, which may be less than what you otherwise consider to be full-time employees. Then the part-time coverage is for people who work a regular schedule of less than 20 hours per week, they become eligible after they've been employed for 175 days, which do not need to be consecutive. Uh, there are some employees of nonprofit organizations who can be excluded from coverage. They are addressed here. It's basically gonna be a uh, certain uh, overtime exempt type level of employees for nonprofit. Many uh, nonprofits are covering these employees anyway under paid family leave. I mean, the notion of the paid family leave program ultimately as we're gonna address is that it's supposed to be employee paid. Um, so on one hand, it doesn't technically cost the employer money to pay the employees who are out. On the other hand, it does mean that more employees are going to be out because now they're getting paid to not work. So there are reasons why employers would presumably not want all of their employees to be eligible for paid family leave. So again, if you have certain nonprofit uh, categories of employees, you might have a carve out. Uh, just some information for out-of-state employers and employees. So this is basically if you have people who are not normally working in New York, but they come to New York to work, if it's occasionally, then you're not going to trigger a paid family leave obligation. But basically, the law says once they work 30 or more days in a calendar year in the state of New York, they're going to be eligible for New York paid family leave. And just living in New York does not entitle you to paid family leave. If you live in New York and work across the border in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut, um, what have you, uh, then you're only eligible for whatever leave is available in that state. A, a somewhat important topic is the idea of waiving paid family leave coverage. So, employers must offer employees who will not meet the minimum eligibility requirements an opportunity to waive paid family leave coverage. But coverage can only be waived if the employee will not meet the time requirements. So if you know that someone will only be employed for two months or you know, for a summer employment or for a holiday shift here and there, whatever, then they have the right to waive it and the employer has to provide them information about the opportunity to waive coverage. If an employee in such a scenario waives coverage, they will not make contributions and will not be eligible for paid family leave benefit. Granted, the only way they can waive it is if there's no reason to expect they would ever be eligible for paid family leave benefits anyway, so they're not really losing anything. Of course, the complication becomes either at the margin, well, do we really know enough to whether this person will meet the requirement or not? And what happens if you thought somebody wasn't going to meet the requirement, but then circumstances change and now they will? Basically, if you thought you were only hiring somebody for the summer, but they end up staying on beyond that indefinitely, then as soon as you know they're potentially staying on long enough to meet the requirement, the waiver would have to be revoked. They could be required to start making the contributions. And eventually, once they meet the 175 day or six month requirements as applicable, would be eligible for paid family leave benefits. So what are these benefits of which we speak? Um, this phased in over time, but we're fully phased in by now. 
the wage replacement is capped at 65% or 67%, I'm sorry, of the average weekly wage in New York. Uh, and uh, so there's two components of that. Technically, it's 67% of the employee's average weekly wage and 67% of the New York State average weekly wage. The New York State average weekly wage is set every year. For 2024, it's currently set at $1,718.15. Which means 67% of that is $1,151.16. And that's the most an employee can get weekly for PFL benefits this year. They can get it for up to 12 weeks. And that is technically across all employers. So if someone has multiple employers and they're eligible for paid family leave from more than one employer, um, somehow that's supposed to be limited to, to this weekly benefit amount and to a total of 12 weeks per year. You know, if somebody has one job, takes 12 weeks of paid family leave and then goes to another job and get to the point where they can qualify, which uh, is possible because you know, somebody who le who's worked for your company for a couple of years leaves at the first part of the first half of the year will already have been eligible for paid family leave and then they could still work six months in the current year and then become eligible. So it is possible you could become eligible for two different employers, uh, even full-time employers um, sequentially within a year. Uh, whether the system is actually good enough to limit that to 12 weeks, I really don't know. I haven't heard any situations where that's been an issue or anybody's been dealing with it. Um, you know, there's obviously could be different insurance companies involved for the different employers and whether the person fills out the paperwork accurately or honestly from one employer to the next could have an impact on that. Just uh, real briefly, visually, here's what has happened to the max weekly benefit over the life of the paid family leave program. You could see it has close to doubled from the beginning and that's both because there was a phase in of the percentage and because the average weekly wage of New York has been increasing. Employee contributions, as I said, this is supposed to be an employee paid benefit. So employers get this as part of their disability insurance uh, coverage and the paid family leave contribution can be uh, taken out of the employee's pay. You don't have to, not every employer is, but to the extent you want to, there is a maximum annual limit. The maximum annual contribution for 2024 is $333.25. Interesting note on this is, this is actually now decreasing. So for obvious reasons, it was increasing during the ramp up because the benefits were getting significantly more generous um, with the phase in. Then during the height of COVID, we reached a peak contribution of over $400 per year. And now it's coming back down and I believe is expected to continue to drop off somewhat um, exactly where it might level off. Um, I don't know. So when can you take paid family leave? This is important and has an important distinction compared to family medical leave. Basically, it's the same as family medical leave, except for those military situations. And with the note that the um, leave is only available for either the birth or adoption of a child or to care for a family member. There's no leave based on the employee's own medical condition. 
I have a note on here, there was a special consideration for paid family leave due to COVID situations that probably is not going to be applicable anymore. We're gonna discuss that COVID leave provision, but there was a way that the COVID leave was tied into paid family leave in certain circumstances. Now, following up on something I just said, I wanna jump quickly into workers' compensation and disability leave. Um, not, not that the nuance really matters too much, but technically New York has something called the workers' compensation law. Part of the workers' compensation law provides for short-term disability coverage for employees. And then the disability program was amended to cover the paid family leave um, benefits. So ultimately this all actually arises out of New York's workers' compensation law. Workers' compensation itself applies to work-related injuries or illnesses that the employee suffers, provides compensation for lost work time and payment of medical bills, um, but it actually doesn't directly entitle employees to time off just because you're injured at work and have the right to get some some wage replacement because you can't work anymore that doesn't actually give you a direct entitlement to be off from work theoretically meaning that all right well i can't work anymore um for some period of time so the employer says well if you can't work then we're going to move on the compl well, multiple complicating aspects of that we're going to come back to, but the direct complicating aspect is the law does prohibit employers from retaliating against employees for seeking or obtaining workers' comp benefits. So you certainly can't say, well, since you've applied for workers' comp, we're going to fire you. Um, and then it becomes dicey to say, okay, well, now you've been out on workers' comp for two months, so now we're going to fire you. Um, you, you would probably face a retaliation claim. But again, if you had some other ba le legitimate basis to say we need to move on, which potentially could even be we need to replace you in this situation, there is not an affirmative um, leave entitlement under the work and compensation law. The same is true for disability insurance. New York State is one of only a few states that requires employers to provide this short-term disability insurance. Uh, it, given the workers' compensation program, disability typically kicks in for non-work injuries or illnesses, but again, for the employee um, personally, not for family members. Again, doesn't directly entitle the employee to time off, but again, has the retaliation provisions, making it obviously questionable to fire someone while they're on uh, or while they're receiving short-term disability benefits. But again, there are circumstances where you would be able to, even though they're still receiving disability insurance benefits. Part of the reason I point all this out is A, that disability insurance was supplemented by paid family leave but because of that, the paid family leave is not available for the employee's own medical condition. The irony is probably most of you know is that paid family leave pays considerably more than short-term disability. So, you know, it's not exactly even um, benefit program. So, you know, whether the employee's own medical condition causing an absence should receive less wage replacement by law than when you're dealing for a family member situation. Um, you know, that's up to the legislature, but as of right now, they have decided that the paid family leave benefit should be higher. The other reason I bring these up is again, to note that paid family leave, again, in the title is both paid and leave and both of those are legal entitlements. So you can theoretically fire someone for taking or forget while they're getting workers comp or short term disability benefit more easily than you can while they're getting paid family because there's not technically a reinstatement right 
That being said, there are a bunch of other discrimination laws and accommodation requirements that are probably going to kick in to put you at pretty much the same place anyway. I'm not going to go through all this, but the covered family members under the paid family leave is an extensive list and siblings were added most recently in 2023. Again, of course, there are notice requirements. There are specific uh, forms that employees will have to fill out. But in the first instance, the employer has to give sufficient notice to employees in the form of some sort of written paid family leave information, either through your handbook or otherwise. And you have to post the notice of compliance like you do with um, workers' comp, noting that you have paid family leave insurance that covers eligible employees. Again, they're supposed to be 30 days notice by the employee if foreseeable and otherwise provide notice as soon as possible. In this case, because there is a paid benefit and the paid benefit is actually an insurance benefit, employees are responsible for submitting their request directly to the insurer. There is a employer component to these forms. So the employer should get notice of the request. But interestingly, it is the insurance carrier, unless you're self-employed or, or self-insured, um, who ultimately determines benefit eligibility. They have to either pay or deny the employee's request within 18 calendar days of receiving the completed request or the within the first day of leave, meaning they have up to 18 days after the leave began, even if they were giving foreseeable notice 30 or more days in advance. That means obviously that the employer often has to allow an employee to take time off before they know whether the carrier is going to ultimately award benefits. Uh, employees can appeal insurer determinations through an arbitration process, but really the employer doesn't have a formal role in approving or denying paid family leave, um, unlike the unpaid um, family medical leave under federal law. And of course, these can be going on simultaneously, so technically an employer can be determining FMLA eligibility for a specific leave while the insurance carrier separately is determining paid family leave eligibility. That being said, with proper designation, employers can run FMLA and paid family leave concurrently and the law and regulations allow that if the employee declines to apply for paid family leave while they're on FMLA leave, the time may be deducted from their paid family leave eligibility anyway. So the employee can't just say, I'm going to take FMLA leave and then I will take my paid family leave later to try to extend the 12 weeks to 24 weeks, for example. Um, so if they just don't apply timely for paid family leave, um, and they're placed on FMLA leave. Again, they can be, even if they haven't requested FMLA leave, if they're actually out of work for, for qualifying circumstances, um, then when they do apply for paid family leave, they're just not going to get it. Or they shouldn't get it, and the necessary information might need to be provided to the insurance company to make sure they don't award it. There's some issues, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but there are specific circumstances where paid family leave and short-term disability can apply together, primarily if, with pregnancy and birth-related circumstances. There are rules on that, um, and disability leave is available for up to 26 weeks, unlike the 12 weeks of paid family leave, and ultimately you can't that one employee can't take more than 26 weeks of combined d d disability and paid family leave in the 52 week period. Okay, next we're gonna 
hit on the New York paid sick leave. This isn't quite as detailed, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it if you're in the private sector because it doesn't apply to public, that is, governmental employers and employees. Um, often they're subject to collective bargaining agreements that provide for sick leave anyway, but that's a separate issue. Um, as you may remember, the law took effect initially in 2020 with this peculiar accrual situation where employees began accruing some time at the end of 2020, but weren't actually entitled to take the paid sick leave until January 1st of 2021. Regardless, at this point, again, we're a few years into the program. Uh, depending on the size of the employer, you're either obligated to give all employees the opportunity to earn up to 40 or 56 hours of leave per year. Um, that is at least one hour per 30 hours physically worked within New York. In other words, if you have an employee who works 30 hours per week, then they accrue an hour of paid family leave per week. If you have somebody who works 60 hours per week, then they would accrue two hours per week and anything pro rata in between. Um, you know, exactly how often you update it probably depends somewhat on your payroll system. It can be combined with other leaves, most notably meaning that you have a paid time off benefit that encompasses sick leave along with, for example, your vacation time. Um, but you do in that situation have to make sure that you still allow people to do everything that they would be entitled to get under the paid sick leave law alone. So if you have under five employees, then it's 40 hours annual max entitlement unpaid. Unless the employer has net income over a million dollars, in which case it becomes paid leave. Up to 100 employees, it's 40 hours paid. And over 100 hours, it's 56 hours paid. You can front load all of that to meet the requirement. Just provide it to everyone on the beginning of the year, whichever year you want to use for this purpose, January 1st, fiscal year, or um, something else, as long as it's done consistently. Um, or you can have them accrue it over time, and you can provide more than 40 or 56 hours, respectively, of course, but that is the minimum. You do have to technically allow carryover of at least the 40 or 56 hours each year. If you front load the leave, the carryover probably becomes academic. However, there's an argument that technically you still need to track how much is carried over. Um, certainly you probably don't want to be in a situation where you're obligated to pay out unused sick leave at the end of employment, especially if you're front loading and there's complicated carryover considerations. Um, and if you do allow carryover and, and assuming you are at the 56 hour requirement, but allow people to earn more than 56 hours, you could limit the carryover to 56 hours. Um, and, and I've certainly seen policies that do that. And sometimes there's PTO issues and I've certainly worked on PTO plans that have pretty complicated carryover conditions of how much time is used for sick leave or other, um, because ultimately there is a risk that you're not carrying over enough. But again, if you get to the payout at the end and allow for payout of unused sick time, that that's gonna then really require an analysis of what should have been carried over. You could, for example, say we'll pay out you know, only the, the time earned in the current year that hasn't been used. So there's all sorts of ways you can do this. Ultimately, you just have to have a very clear policy on it. Seasonal employees under the law maintain accrued leave despite normal breaks in employment. 
So that would mean if, if you normally work every summer, or you normally work every holiday season, or you normally work May, June, November, and December from year to year, then you keep it despite gaps in employment. I think if you were just hired for one holiday season and then separated with no particular expectation, you'd come back the next year and you probably have an argument that they don't maintain their accrued leave. Um, here's where the paid sick leave comes in. It's pretty broad, physical illness or injury of the employee or a family member and other medical evaluations and treatments. And there's a safe leave component, so various absences related to domestic violence. Here's the expansive list of family members. Here is the extensive uh, list of safe leave scenarios, including the last one, take any other actions necessary to ensure the health or safety of the employer, family member, et cetera. So, you know, if there is someone who's been the victim domestic violence, um, then they're going to have the right to take time off as paid sick leave for a number of different reasons. Again, there's notice requirements, but for the employee, pretty minimal. They just have to request the leave before taking it. You can't require them to give certain amount of advance notice. You can certainly allow them to use leave on less than prior notice. So, you know, somebody who doesn't call in before the start of their shift because they were too sick to call and you want to count it as sick leave, um, you can certainly do that, but you can't require them to call in the night before or else not be eligible for sick leave. And there's pretty severe restrictions on what you can require employees to provide. You can't require them to provide confidential medical information ultimately attesting that they met the circumstances for um, sick leave is sufficient according to DOL regulations to be entitled to take the time off. Um, you have to describe and provide written notice of what your leave increment is and the minimum increment can't be longer than four hours. Finally, um, on this topic, uh, beginning January 1st, there will be a new prenatal leave aspect of the paid sick leave law. Um, it, it's in the paid sick leave law, but don't let that confuse you. This is a separate bucket of 20 hours of leave during any 52 calendar week period. So this doesn't count off of the 40 or 56 hours you're otherwise entitled to provide, and it's specifically available for healthcare related to the pregnancy, including physical examinations, medical procedures, monitoring and testing, and discussions with a healthcare provider related to the pregnancy. Although it's not entirely specific, it's believed that this only means the employee um, herself is pregnant not situation where the employee spouse is pregnant and they want to attend a medical visit. But you do have to allow this 20 hours in as little as hourly installments. Again, that takes effect January 1st. Again, this is part of the paid sick leave, which means it doesn't apply if you're in the public sector. All right, I know we're at the end of our two hour or our one hour and I will start taking questions relatively soon. I'm thinking I need about five minutes to wrap up on the last section. This is not the last section. This is COVID-19 leave. You're all familiar with this. Just to put it in front of you, the existing law expires now, July 31st, 2025. Um, at the moment, there's uncertainty whether somebody could actually still take pay COVID-19 leave because they technically under the law have always had to have a quarantine or isolation order. And it's not clear that there's really any guideline right now that would justify an isolation order just because someone tested positive for COVID-19. CDC and New York State Department of Health guidance does not require isolation. 
for COVID-19 at this stage. Um, but if you have an employee seeking this leave, you are certainly within your right to require them to provide an isolation order. The problem is they can go online and still find a document they can download and sign that would purport to entitle them to this leave. I'm just not sure that the state actually intends for those to be effective anymore. So if you have that situation and want to figure out what to do, um, you just have to look into it on a case by case basis. Again, the final issue, and, and this, again, is going to have more information in here than we really need to go through, but it's important for me to, to mention and have for you available. But ultimately, under the ADA or the New York Human Rights Laws, state or city, um, there are disability accommodation entitlements. There are also, under these laws, religion accommodation requirements, pregnancy and under New York law, victim of domestic violence, accommodation rights. Religion briefly may require that you give somebody leave, but normally it's gonna be a pretty short term leave and often a schedule switching type of scenario due to observance of a holiday. You know, and we're really thinking more about a little bit longer leaves in this situation. So in relevant respects, victim of domestic violence, pregnancy related, and disability leaves are kind of similar in the sense that ultimately um, there are circumstances where changing schedules, including giving some time off, may be considered a reasonable accommodation. This builds up to a couple of important points. Um, Many employers have in their handbooks that you can take up a certain amount of leave time for medical issue after which you would be terminated. It is pretty clear that if the person has a continuing medical need for time off beyond the expiration of family medical leave or paid family leave, that you have to consider whether allowing them additional time off is a accommodation that they're entitled to that doesn't pose an undue hardship on the company. And the EEOC historically has taken the position that if you just have a maximum leave policy, then you're not engaging in the necessary analysis. Even if it's as long as six or 12 months, if it just once you get to the end of that, it's you're done, um, that could be deemed a violation of the ADA or the human rights law. The safer approach is to have a guideline maximum with the understanding and express understanding that it's possible that there be an extension for a reasonable additional time period. I would say even if you have a policy that reads as absolute, if you get to the end of that time period, you want to have some information about when that person might actually be able to come back. And if you don't, um, then you should try to get it. If they won't provide it or can't provide it, or there's an indefinite guideline provided, then you should be able to terminate relatively safely. But if you've gotten to the end of the six or 12 month period that you stayed as the max, but they have information that they could return in a week and a half, it's gonna be pretty hard to say we couldn't accommodate them for an extra week and a half. All right, finally, here's the, the last little piece of this, best practices, how to manage employee leave requests. Well, obviously you wanna update and follow your written policies um, as consistently as possible. Train obviously HR, but also other supervisors on procedures to the extent they need to know them. Most of all, they need to know how to point an employee to the right person as soon as possible. So if you have an employee says, I think I'm gonna need some time off because I'm having surgery and tells their supervisor that, the supervisor can't just nod and leave it at that. They need to report it so that the right paperwork for FMLA or whatever it might be can be provided. Of course, any medical issues you have to handle particularly carefully because you know we just talked about six or seven different legal regimes that could relate to an employee or an employee's family member's medical condition, and you have to make sure that you're complying with all of those. 
Uh, especially with medical issues, I, I would say start with the assumption that leave will be available, but work through all the necessary requirements and conditions. Have they provided the right documentation and support for their leave? Have we given them the right information and documentation so that they know what they need to provide, um, et cetera? Well, I mean, all this makes a lot of sense if you have a, a sophisticated and experienced HR function. Obviously, some companies don't, so it's harder. Um, they don't have people that are thinking about this all the time. But nonetheless, they're still subject to the laws. Documenting employee leave, uh, FMLA and, P and paid family leave have formal documentation. You can download from the Department of Labor websites or for PFL through your insurance carrier, et cetera. Um, there are various ways to communicate other leave requests, even paid sick leave, whether that be a call in or some sort of electronic notice system, text, email, whatever it is. Again, obviously, the best idea would be to have some consistent practice that you either expect employees to follow or that you follow internally once you get any sort of notification from an employee. Medical record may be necessary in some cases, especially both the family medical, paid family leave um, situations and the leave provided as an accommodation. You can't seek medical record necessarily in most cases for mere sick leave usage. Um, so you need to know those types of considerations. And of course, when you do get any medical records, you need to maintain confidentiality, limit the distribution of those internally on a need to know basis and store them in separate confidential medical files, not the employee's general personnel file. Finally, um, when it comes to terminating employees on leave, which we uh, alluded to a couple of times, I would say it's pretty much always a good idea to seek legal advice um, if you're not a lawyer or not an employment lawyer um, or don't handle these things regularly. Um, just to make sure you're not going to get tripped up under one of these statutes, there are many potential protections for employees. Um, but ultimately, employees don't have the absolute right to be away from work as long as they want. Uh, in all cases, certainly you want to avoid retaliation or discrimination. The fact that somebody took time off or availed themselves of a leave or benefit they're entitled to can't be the reason that you're terminating them. And certainly be careful with documentation around this. Again, if you're going to be terminating someone because they've been on leave for too long and you don't know if they'll ever return. You know, there's recommendations like giving them an opportunity to provide medical records that say what their current status is. Then if they don't provide that, uh, you might even follow up and say, here's one more try, let me know. Then if they don't provide that, you move on. Um, or in the actual termination letter, be careful your wording. You don't want to necessarily just say, um, you've now been out for six months on a medical leave, so we're firing you for reasons that I discussed before. Uh, the last point, then I'm gonna start answering questions and I'm gonna give you access to the slides, is that um, within the last year or so, New York law now expressly prohibits adverse action based on employees use of any legally protected absence pursuant to federal, local or state laws. Most of these laws already had anti-retaliation and discrimination provisions, but just in case this change in law is designed really to say you can't use no fault attendance policies. Uh, it, it, it's broader than that, but that was the real goal of it. In other words, any policy that says, all right, if you're out of work, we're going to give you a point or however many points. And then once you get a certain number of points, for whatever the reason that you are out of work, then we're going to start disciplining you, perhaps with progressive discipline leading to termination. Um, if any absence is covered by sick leave, family leave, uh, you know, a, an accommodation under ADA or human rights law as a disability or you know, any other type of jury duty, militarily, anything else that's legally protected, you cannot assess any points or otherwise take that into consideration. Even if you don't have a specific point policy, you know, you can't just say at the end of somebody's probationary period, well, you've hardly ever been here. 
so we're letting you go if the reason they were hardly ever there was they were using you know paid sick leave for example that they were entitled to okay thanks for bearing with me for a few extra minutes i'm going to start answering questions before i do that though i'm going to post the link to get the slides like i said if you're registered which most of you should be if you're hearing this live then you will get an email tomorrow there is one hour of pre-approved um hrci credit for those of you who have credentials with that organization um, you will get a confirmation of that in an email as well if you've attended this presentation the uh, next thing i'm going to do is quickly look at the questions figure out the best order to answer them give you a second to download the slides and we will then like i said stay on if you have any more questions keep typing them in There, all right, I'm going to start with uh, this question. There's a question about paying for health insurance while someone is on paid family leave or family medical leave. Well, if they're on paid family leave, the money that they're getting paid is not coming through the employer. So you still have the same problem of where do we get the money to pay their contribution um, and the question also specifically asked, can we deduct the amount before they leave? Um, you, you have to be careful about it because of course there are other laws and restrictions on making deductions from employees pay. Um, but depending on what the circumstance is, as long as the employee signs off on the deduction for their medical coverage, then you're probably going to be okay. The, the trickier problem is usually you, you're not going to be able to deduct it in advance for practical reasons, or you just didn't know until after the person is already out that they were going to be on leave. So um, you, you can, when the person goes out, have them sign something specifically saying what they're going to repay, how and when. Uh, let's see, a lot of other questions. Yeah, so there, there was a question about FMLA leave that expires. So yes, the law says while they're on FMLA leave, they have a right to reinstatement. You can lose that right to reinstatement, by the way, if you flat out say, I have no interest in coming back to work or I'm quitting or I'm looking for another job or whatever, you might still be entitled to continue the rest of your FMLA leave, but at that point you would have potentially waived your right to reinstatement. Regardless, at the end of FMLA leave, you can never fire someone merely because they're still out and their FMLA leave has expired if if they might have some protected basis for being out on leave you know if someone goes out because of the birth of a child for 12 weeks and then doesn't come back you know on the monday for example after the 12 weeks has expired they're arguably not protected by any other law for their right to take that day off and you might be able to use that against them. But I would question whether at that point, you know, one day is sufficient to warrant termination. If they don't come back for three weeks, um, then, you know, it becomes a different question. The, the more common situation though, is someone who's had surgery, uh, needs the full 12 weeks or more to recover, you get to the end of the 12 weeks and then they need another month. In that case, you're probably talking about a situation where the employee is going to be entitled to some additional leave as a disability accommodation, or at least a situation where you better be considering that um, before you just say, well, if you don't come back tomorrow, you're fired.
There's a question about if we have an employee who is returned to work after FMLA leave, what is equivalent pay? Um, th there might be some complicated scenarios, but I mean, the, the most general idea is if you have somebody come back as a line operator A, and you also have line operators B, line operators A work on the left side of the floor and line operators B work on the right side of the floor. And for whatever reason, line operators A make $2,000 a week and line operators B make $1,500 a week. And someone comes back from FMLA leave and you don't have any open spaces on line operator a put them on the b side um you would you would literally still have to pay them the two thousand dollars a week in that scenario and that's assuming that the work of line operator b for some reason is essentially equivalent to line operator a um you know so basically it literally means they have to make at least the same amount as they were making before, presumably, if it's a situation where they're brought back and working fewer hours, that could also be a problem if they're an hourly employee. You know, it's not just we're still paying you $20 an hour, but now you're working fewer hours. It would have to be, um, you know, the full total compensation, at least on average. I mean, obviously, you can imagine complicated situations where mm -hmm. it's more difficult to figure out, but that's generally the best I can say on that. There was a question about how much of a break in service before the 175 day clock starts over. That's for the part-time paid family leave eligibility. I don't think there's any specific guidance on that. The, the issue is whether it's seasonal or not, probably. Um, I mean, that, that was specifically spelled out in the paid sick leave law, but not necessarily the same uh, language in the paid family leave law. But I think the idea is whether someone's employment has ended. If their employment has ended with no expectation of return, then that could start the clock over. But that, you know, obviously could get questioned on a case by case basis. The FMLA has a specific provision on whether the person returns to work within a certain amount of time. I think it's like a year. Well, that might not be exactly right, but I don't think the paid family leave has that same specific provision. So it, it's probably a little more case by case. Here's a question. If an employee's exhausted FMLA, why can't you terminate if they're on comp or disability while the comp and disability benefit can continue? Well, you might be able to. The question becomes whether they have an independent right to additional leave. As I said, comp and disability don't give you a right to leave, technically. Uh, if your FMLA is elapsed and you're on comp and di or disability, you're probably then suffering from some medical condition that at the very least under New York law is going to con constitute a disability for which you might be entitled to a reasonable accommodation. The question then becomes whether you're entitled to a reasonable accommodation and if so, what accommodation is reasonable if it's a situation where the person could return to work for uh, basically the same position, et cetera, but they need to have some sort of reasonable modification made to the job, 
but they just decide they don't want to do that. They want to stay home and collect comp or disability. Then yes, you might be able to terminate. If it's a situation where, you know, their surgery has put them in a situation where even though they've exhausted FMLA, they're going to need another month or six weeks to recover, or they need to adjust to medification medication and there's no other way they can be accommodated to return to work in the meantime um, then the leave it's a continued leave at that point might be considered um, a reasonable accommodation and if you terminate them then you may be in violation of the ADA or the human rights law of course at the margins on all of this too is that you know it's one thing as to do you have the better argument at the end of the day? And it's another thing as to how easy is it for somebody to file a disability discrimination claim? And do you really want to deal with that if it's the difference between letting somebody stay out a little bit longer or not? Yeah, there's a follow-up question on the paid sick leave for the break in accruals. Again, I think it, it's at what point in time is the employment actually ended with no expectation of return. Somebody leaves and quits and says, I'm going to take another job, but that job doesn't work out. And a month later, they come back. Um, I don't believe that the accruals are still there for them. If it's, you know, I normally work every summer and winter um, break because I'm in college and I've been doing it uh, with the expectation of coming back next year, then it's at least a closer call. There's one more question right now that I'm about to answer, but if anybody else has any more questions, I know a lot of people have had to go, but I want to answer any questions that I can. Go ahead and start typing that in, or at least let me know that you're working on formulating your question. The, la the last question that I see to answer is whether the New York State paid family leave benefits are taxable to employees um they are to some extent my be best understanding is that they are subject to federal income taxes but not new york state income taxes and they're not subject to certain other withholdings like the FICA and FUTA. Not 100% sure on all of that, but I am pretty sure that they are taxed as income by the IRS. Okay, I think I've answered all the questions that I've seen. If you think I didn't answer your question, then type something to let me know, or if you have a different question, type something to let me know. Otherwise, thanks everybody for staying on. I know I ran a little long and then um, obviously, you know, I wanna answer whatever questions there are. Okay, I don't see anybody telling me that they had something else they wanted me to address. So I'm going to go ahead and assume that we are done and I appreciate again your time look for your email tomorrow to either confirm your attendance or to give you access to the slides and in fact you should also at that point be able to watch a replay of this video if there was anything else you wanted to catch again thank you and I will see you next time